go, passes through the oxygen minimum zone and reaches deep water. Um, so there's a lot of other work ongoing still in that area. Um, then I'd like to move to the Antarctic. Um, I currently have a project down here um, in McMurdo Sound. Talk a little bit about it. Oh, so back up, I guess I added this slide. Um, I've spent years working in and around the Antarctic Peninsula, which is a region of one of the fastest warming places on the globe um, besides the Arctic. And so um, there's um, a lot of work going on here to, to look at the effects of um, what that's doing to the ecosystem. We know it's changing sea ice duration, sea ice extent. Um, there's been changes in um, phytoplankton blooms and distribution. These are some papers we've published in the last few years. Um, a lot of my work is focused on the Antarctic krill, Euphausia superba, um, sort of basic ecology, but Euphausia superba is the basis of a commercial fishery, and it's considered to be an underutilized fishery. Um, they've currently increased harvesting to about 200,000 tons. Um, there have been some estimates it could go up to a, a million tons and still be sustainable, um, but the largest catches are here at the end of the Antarctic Peninsula, um, and they're often gravid females during summer forming <laughs> swarms. Um, plus, this is the region that is warming. Um, there's evidence suggesting that 50% of the krill population has de declined over the last 50 years. Um, uh, the sea ice is retreating, and we've found that um, phytoplankton blooms that used to co occur up at the northern end of the Antarctic Peninsula um, are no longer supported, but instead we have these large persistent blooms that occur at the southern end. Um, so I had a farmer student, Marina Marari, who collaborated with Chua Men to look at the climatology of um, phytoplankton blooms in the region. And I've been working with um, a group of modelers, Eileen Hoffman, um, her student Andrea um, Pannonis, um, Michael Deneman, and John Clink to um, use a coupled physical biological model to look at the connectivity and transport of, of um, krill. Um, it's unknown whether or not the krill populations along the Antarctic Peninsula are self-sustaining or dependent upon um, lateral transport and um, recruitment from other regions. And it indeed looks like it is dependent. There's certainly um, connectivity and input from upstream populations onto the shelf. So in a five-minute overview, it's a very short summary of some of the results we've been working on. The project that I'm working on in the in McMurdo sounds a little different um, than things I've done before. We had tried to get funding um, to use ships to go in and work on this project, but were unsuccessful. So we decided, well, we didn't need ships, we'd use snowmobiles. Mm -hmm. um, so this is uh, the fast ice edge off of McMurdo. And um, the focus of this project is to look at the um, impact of predation, uh, the top-down forcing on um, pelagic zooplankton and fish in this um, system in the Ross Sea. The Ross Sea is still relatively pristine compared to most other ocean systems. There um, has been some whaling um, that occurred in the 20s along with um, other regions in the Antarctic, and there's currently a fishery for the Patagonia toothfish. Most of you will recognize it as the Chilean sea bass. Do not order it. <laughs> It's a highly volatile, um, not supported um, fishery. Um, the sea bass, um, actually, they're huge fish. They grow very slowly. They don't reproduce that often. And we really don't know enough about their, even their life history um, to support the fishery. But anyway, um, so our particular project is looking at three very abundant predators, um, Adelie penguins, minke whales, and um, one um, group of killer whales that eat fish. There's several groups of killer whales. Some of them eat seals, some eat fish. Um, uh, and again, looking at the mortality pressure that they um, exert on their prey, uh, a type of um, euphousid or krill, and then a fish that lives under the sea ice. 
And um, the way we could do this without a ship is that every year an icebreaker comes in and breaks a channel through fast ice so that the supply vessel can come into McMurdo Station. And um, the predator investigators had noted that when they did that, thousands of penguins and dozens of whales and seals followed the icebreaker in having a feeding frenzy. So the sea ice has acted as a uh, refugium for the prey until the icebreaker comes in. So we were going to make use of this as a natural experiment. Um, so our experiment addresses three questions. Uh, what are the seasonal changes in fast ice? The physical ocean RV conditions, phytoplankton, distribution of phytoplankton, krill, and fish um, before the icebreaker comes in and then after the icebreaker comes in. And here you can see a picture of the euphousid. Um, the fish, they're fairly small. Um, one of the killer whales. And then the Adeli penguins have been studied in this region for um, many, many years. They have a long time series. And here you can see this little guy is coming back to his colony and they've gated it so they have to walk through, they have a scale so they can actually measure their changed weight over time and after they go out, you know, when they leave to go out to feed and when they come back, they're all tagged so they, you know, they all have their, um, so th they track a lot of the physiology, uh, physiological variables with these guys. Um, oops. Um, so this is just a map of where we're working. Um, this is the, here's the Ross Sea out here. Um, this is the Ross um, ice shelf, which you can see <coughs> part of it here. And McMurdo's just kind of on the very edge. So we're working down at the very bottom of the Ross Sea, the southern region. So this is a blow up. This is um, the ice shelf. So there's water um, under here. Uh, this is land. It's an island. It's the Ross Island. And then McMurdo's right on the very <coughs> back side of this little peninsula. And this shows um, major penguin colonies. Um, penguins in this area are very successful. Um, their population um, has been increasing for a number of years. Um, this is the fast ice edge and general circulation. Um, so our study area is roughly in here. Um, this shows the path of the vessel. Um, breaking through to McMurdo. Um, so again, we just turned the map upside down, but we're working in this area. Um, just some pictures I'll go through really quickly. This is McMurdo Base. Uh, instead of being on a ship every day, we packed up our gear, um, drove it down onto the ice, packed it in the snowmobile. So we were using remotely operated vehicles, so we had lots of um, uh, computer equipment, sensitive electronics, um, ice drills, we had a huge amount of equipment. Um, and I should mention Heather Broadbent, I noticed she came in earlier. She was one of our main people. She was down there for three months last year. I'll be going back down again. Um, here's our camp. Uh, so we set up a tent with all the electronics in it. This is a piston bully. It's really fun to drive out onto the ice. So it's, it was about 25 miles out to the ice edge and back every day. It was quite a haul. So, um, so we had to pack everything up into these banana sleds, um, drill through the ice, and then um, here's our ROV. So it was built to go through a tenon jiffy drill hole. So it's long and thin. Um, this is the ROV part, the remotely operated vehicle with cameras, and then uh, this is called Skinny, and then um, it had this tail we call Fatty that had um, 120 kilohertz acoustic echo sounder on it and a wet labs um, fluorescence backscatter sensor. Um, so it, we slip it in through the ice hole and then we do transects under the ice. Um, so here is our stations going in from the ice edge. And this is just a time series of our results um, at this station here and then out here. And this is just to show you that over the three-month period, we saw long, large changes. Initially, early in, in November, it's pretty much isothermal. Um, then the water heats up. A lot of the ice disappears in this area. Um, and I will point out the scale is very narrow here. This looks like it's really warming, but you know, there's not much change in temperature here. 
Um, but we did see warming in the ice. We did see ice uh, um, salinity changes. There was a lot of ice melt under the sea ice, which um, changed densities. Um, we took ice cores to look at food availability. The wa ice water interface, you can see a lot of um, uh, ice, um, um, ice biota growing there. Um, and here's a blow up of, um, or um, some images from um, uh, microscopic images. Uh, we had long chain stringy diatoms, um, which aren't normally seen out in this region of Big Myrtle Sound. <clears throat> so the chlorophyll values that we observed changed over time. The ice algae was very high in November and then um, started as the water warmed up, sloughed off and disappeared by January. Um, these values are up to 1,000 micrograms per liter, which are some of the highest values ever reported from McMurdo. The water column samples were um, usually about 10 micrograms or, left or less, but we did get some up to 40, which is, again, some of the highest values ever observed in this region. Um, we're also looking at um, high-performance liquid chromatography, phytoplankton pigments, um, particular organic carbon. Um, other <coughs> PIs tagged whales um, and uh, penguins, and so we tracked them over time uh, to see where they were feeding and at what depths. Um, uh, I just I found out just before this talk that um, it was being recorded, so I had to take out some of my copi <laughs> data so it wouldn't go on the website. Um, but we have some pretty interesting results. The killer whales um, largely followed the ice edge as it melted, retreated back. Um, we were also trying to figure out what they were eating, so they were collecting scats. But here you can see an old picture. Oops, did it again. Um, an old picture of a killer whale eating a Patagonia toothfish, which is um, some of their normal food. Um, they also eat our prey, Pleurogramma. Um, but of course, you know, you have a well-planned oceanographic study and it's always an anomalous year by the time you get out there. And um, the prey did not do what we expected. Um, and it turned out the killer whales were instead, shoot, um, here you can see it's feeding on this little ice fish called Pagathenia um, borch. Gravinki. They live up under the ice. So this is the equivalent of all of you eating one rice grain at a time. I mean, these big, huge whales were feeding on these tiny, tiny little fish. We don't even know how they were able to catch them. Um, so here's, a, here's an image of those fish underwater. So this is a research in progress. Um, we're going down for another year. Uh, we're expanding our survey area and um, we'll be doing um, a lot more intensive um, work to collect meteorological uh, information observations as well as um, more CTD profiles and um, um, more observations using our uh, remotely operated vehicle and acoustic system. That's I think all I had.